Okay, here is our final installment for our toxicity and water pollution unit. Uh, what we'll be talking about today is some of the water purification steps and treatment for household use. So the water coming into your house, what happens to it before it gets there. Uh, and likewise, we will look at what goes on to treat the water that leaves your house. Uh, so the water that comes out of your sinks, your bathtub, your washing machine, your toilet, uh, all that's got to go somewhere and go through some sort of treatment to help maintain uh, water quality out in the environment. All right. Uh, the textbook pages that accompany this, although some of this information will not be found in your textbook, is page 525 through 529 there in chapter 22. All right. Purification of drinking water. We have, uh, for the most part, um, if you are getting your water from a municipality like the city, for example, of Walla Walla, right uh your water's going to come to you um uh treated okay so if you're on the city of all water that water comes to you having gone through some treatment processes now if you're on your own private well uh the amount of treatment that happens is going to vary based on the location um, and what, what types of systems you have coming into your house but if you are part of a city water system it's going to go through some sort of treatment before it gets to your house all right, um, and typically that water is going to be collected from some sort of aquifer or reservoir, so some sort of groundwater supply or surface water supply. In the case of Walla Walla, we get our water from uh, surface water up in the watershed for the most part, and that travels downhill uh, from the watershed, which is a little over 2,000 feet, I believe, up there, uh, to Walla Walla. And interestingly, uh, set of a side note, is we actually generate electricity uh, from our municipal water supply. So as that water travels through pipes downhill, we use the flow of that water to generate a little bit of electricity too. One of the cool things that we do here with water in Walla Walla. All right, uh, so we're gonna talk about what goes on in that treatment process. Now this is not always gonna be the case every time, uh, but these are just our general steps for what goes on, all right? So moving forward, uh, we've got water purification steps. So. Uh, the first thing they're going to do, so uh, especially since we are on surface water, so uh, we actually have a pretty pristine watershed. They keep people locked out of there because they don't want people coming in and messing uh, with the habitat surrounding the water, and that helps make sure that the water going into the watershed for us is pretty pure. But uh, we're going to get some debris uh, because it is surface water, so leaves, sticks, etc., are mixed in with that water. All right, so the first thing they're going to do is that they're going to screen it. All right? This is similar to filtering, although it's a very, very coarse filter. And all they're trying to do in that case is get rid of, rid of large debris like uh, sticks and leaves, etc. All right, uh, then they're going to do a little bit of aeration. So they'll run some uh, air bubbles through the water, and that helps to get rid of some of the dissolved gases and suspended particles. Uh, and then typically, and this really depends again on your water supply, this may or may not be a necessary step in, in our water because it tends to be really, really uh, pure, uh, not pure, I should say, uh, sediment free would be a better way to say that most of the time. But oftentimes, uh, depending on where you get your water, there's uh, suspended particles that are really small that won't just like settle out really quickly. And so what they'll do is they'll add some sort of flocculation or coagulation agent and that causes a lot of those particles to stick together to form bigger particles, which will then uh, relatively rapidly settle out to the bottom, all right? Uh, which leads to that sedimentation phase, right? So the coagulated particles settle to the bottom, right? And so now we have water that's relatively free of uh, coarser uh, particles, okay? Um, after they've done that, then they run it through some sort of filter. And the filter uh, will typically uh, get rid of the really, really small particles and, in some cases, a lot of the microorganisms that might cause some damage to our, uh, our systems. Okay? Um, so it's really important they go through that sedimentation process first, though. Otherwise, the filters would clog really quickly. So they get rid of a lot of the particles before they filter it. All right, then after filtration, there's some sort of disinfection process, all right, um, which may or may not always be necessary, but if this is a safety precaution, all right, uh, and so they, typically that would be done with chlorine or with UV light or ozone, uh, an oxidizing agent. They'll pump that through the water and kill off any uh, remaining microorganisms that might get in and 
and, uh, might be parasitic and cause damage to our, our digestive tract, etc. All right, so those are the six basic steps in water purification. All right, um, now we're going to take a, a kind of a side step here and talk about the pros and cons of using chlorine versus ultraviolet light. Okay, uh, so both of them kill microorganisms pretty effectively. Okay, um, chlorine has it because it's a chemical additive and it stays in the water. Um, the water that gets chlorinated stays disinfected as it leaves the water treatment center. Okay, and makes its way through the, 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 the delivery pipes to your household. Whereas ultraviolet light, while very effective initially, it doesn't have lasting disinfecting properties because it's light that goes in and kills microorganisms. But as soon as the water is no longer exposed to the UV light, uh, it's no longer going to continue to disinfect that water. And so there is a chance if you're using only UV light um, that the water could be infected en route from the treatment center to your household. Whereas the chlorine additive helps to prevent that from happening. Um, now, one of the dilemmas with chlorine, though, is it is a chemical additive and does kill microorganisms, uh, you know, and so in theory, too much chlorine could also cause some damage to you, all right? So obviously, when they use chlorine, they keep it well below the damage levels, way below what's in your swimming pool even, all right? Um, but uh, some of the chlorine byproducts are linked to some illnesses. Now, this would not... Okay, again, if you're getting your water from the city of Walla Walla, for example, the chlorine additive would not cause these issues, right? This is when too much chlorine is used, and we keep it well, well below that mark, okay? But you may notice sometimes when you're using a municipal water supply that there is a faint kind of chlorine smell, okay? Uh, but, you know, so some people are concerned about maybe health impacts or even just the fact that it affects the scent of your water. It kind of smells like chemicals, and you don't really want to drink chemicals. Uh, that, that makes sense to me. But um, one of the cases where Peru stopped using chlorine, uh, as a result, they had a huge cholera epi epidemic that uh, infected 300,000 people as soon as they stopped using uh, chlorine additive. So there, there's some trade-offs to be made there. Although I will say um, uh, Brita filters do help to get rid of that. But if you just put your water uh, in a pitcher in the refrigerator, for example, because the chlorine is a gas, it actually will uh, eventually dissipate out into the, the atmosphere. And you won't have that chlorine smell or taste anymore. You just have to let it sit out for a little while. Okay? Um, but uh, another kind of controversy, and Walla Walla actually stopped adding fluoride to its water supply a few years ago um, because there is some controversy with it. Um, it's not very well founded. Uh, I will say this scientifically, uh, the fluorine or fluoride, excuse me, additive we put in water is there primarily to help uh, protect teeth. Uh, so fluoride toothpaste, fluoride mouthwashes, the fluoride you get at the dentist office when you're a kid. Uh, those compounds help to strengthen your tooth enamel. Um, and one of the arguments being made for adding fluoride compounds to municipal water supplies is that it will help prevent tooth decay. Um, now, there's all kinds of, of literature out there about the, the pros and cons of adding fluoride, and there's this sort of kind of a conspiracy theory that uh, it's just a way for uh, industry to dispose of their, their some of their byproducts that contain fluoride. Uh, it's a way of skirting the Safe Drinking Water Act and so on. Uh, from what I found uh, out there, the scientific literature says that the amount of fluoride added is not at all harmful to people. And in fact, it is effective at helping to prevent tooth decay. Uh, but there's lots of people that don't like it, and they can tend to be a, a really, really vocal minority. And as a result of that vocal minority, we no longer uh, put fluoride in our drinking water in Walla Walla. All right. I hate that bell. Anyway, uh, so now moving on to what happens to your water after it leaves your house. So you get this nice purified drinking water. It feeds the plumbing in your house. Um, once it leaves your house, so it goes down your drain, um, if you are connected to sewage, system uh, there's uh, several steps the first step though so it goes through the sewer pipes to a sewage treatment plant at the sewage treatment plant um, and undergoes several phases of treatment and in primary treatment uh, essentially what happens that like, goes in your sedimentation tank right and it separates out into three layers the bottom layer 
uh, would be what they call primary sludge, and that is the, the solids um, that come from your wastewater treatment. The second layer would be then your wastewater, and then there also tends to be a little layer at the top of that sedimentation tank. Um, they often refer to as sewage scum. Okay, so you got sewage sludge, which is the solids that settle on the bottom. You got your wastewater, and then the top layer is that scum layer. Okay, uh, now. After primary treatment, the wastewater and the sludge actually get diverted to different places. Okay, um, so the water, okay, gets goes into an aeration tank and undergoes secondary treatment. Now this is the liquid from your waste stream, right? Whereas the sludge, the solid part, gets separated out and treated separately. Okay, it goes into a, a digester. We'll talk about those steps here in just a minute. Okay, so the sewage sludge, uh, which are the solids that are made after primary treatment, has been completed. All right, uh, those solids then go to uh, what they call a, an anaerobic and aerobic digestion and decomposition. So what they do is they make use of uh, the capabilities of bacteria and protists and fungus and stuff like that to break down those solids um, over time. Okay, and then the solids left over can, uh, first of all, sometimes they produce methane and they can produce energy from that methane, by the way. Uh, likewise, the leftovers, once they've kind of been decomposed and are no longer harmful, can be used as a soil method. Howdy. All right, um, and so that's, that's the basic path for the, the solids. All right, now it can just go off to the landfill as well. It's not always sold off as compost. So sometimes it just gets sent to the landfill, sometimes it ends up being compost, etc. All right. Um, now the tertiary treatment of our, our wastewater. So again, keep in mind in secondary treatment. Let me go back here a little bit. Sorry. Uh, we take uh, um, biological methods. So again, bacteria, fungus, protozoans, and they decompose the organic material, break things down. They get rid of a lot of the, the harmful bacteria and so on. Uh, so decompose the, the organic waste that's in your wastewater. Okay, that's secondary treatment. Now, um, what does not happen during secondary treatment, however, is uh, the removal of your nitrogen and phosphorus. Maybe a little nitrogen comes out. Uh, but nitrogen and phosphorus, keep in mind, those are our uh, inorganic plant and algal nutrients that often accompany, or always accompany, wastewater. Okay? Um, and so in the, the breaking down, the, pri the secondary treatment, primary treatment, there very little of that is removed. So now technically the water that leaves after secondary treatment should be relatively free of harmful pathogens and kind of all the nastiness that we associate with wastewater, uh, but it's still really high in uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. And so most uh, municipalities now undergo some sort of what they call tertiary treatment. Um, and that's done to uh, reduce the phosphorus and the nitrogen. One example of what they do, and if the, the locale allows for it, uh, this is another instance where wetlands can be extremely useful. They'll, they'll run that water through either a natural or an artificial wetland. And because of the basic properties of wetlands and the, the flora and fauna that exist in wetlands, that can have a big reduction in the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, if the uh, wetland's not practical, um, they can remove it chemically, just to undergo some chemical reactions to remove that. Okay, but tertiary treatment typically is done to remove the excess nitrogen and phosphorus, which can kick off that whole eutrophication process we talked about earlier in the unit. All right. Uh, and of course, to make sure uh, whether tertiary treatment happens or does not happen, there's still always going to be some sort of disinfection step just to make sure that we're not releasing uh, any nasty critters back out in nature uh, from our wastewater. So chlorine or UV light, etc. cetera, uh, before they always do that before they let the water go back out in nature. All right. Um, now, uh, the book has a pretty cool little graphic there that kind of shows what gets removed from the wastewater in, in various steps. So for example, uh, we're not really going to have a big reduction in phosphorus until after tertiary treatment. Same goes for nitrogen, uh, uh, et cetera. So the white here is uh, represented in complete removal. The kind of the really light browns you see here uh, represent what they would consider uh, adequate removal, but not complete removal. All right. So chlorination treatment, of course, is going to get rid of the really bad uh, viruses and so on. 
Um, but that tertiary treatment step is needed to get rid of those nitrogen and phosphorus compounds. Okay. Um, anyways, that's, that's the basic summary of how they treat the water that comes into your house and then how they treat the water that leaves your house. Um, now keep it in mind, um, we have, this is not discussed necessarily in the book specifically. Uh, this is sort of a side slide here that I wanted to make sure you guys had in your notes. Um, we've talked about riparian buffers, riparian zones before, uh, but it is, that is that zone of vegetation that often uh, is right along our stream beds, right? So we get a big increase in the amount of vegetation along stream beds. Uh, we're in the process here in Walla Walla County of restoring as many of these riparian areas as we can. And they are great because they help reduce sediment pollution. They help uh, absorb runoff. They help absorb nitrogen and phosphorus before it gets out into streams. Really, really important in our agricultural areas, right? Because as you should recall at this point, agriculture is the number one cause of water pollution in the U.S. All right? Uh, and that wraps things up.